Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I am your host, Zach Peterson, and today we are going to be looking at how to calculate the impedance of a via. Now, the reason I bring up this particular topic and wanted to do a video on it is because I'm seeing a lot of via impedance calculators out there. The problem is that these via impedance calculators are wrong. They are only useful in a certain situation when you actually don't need the via impedance. Once you actually do need to know the via impedance, they end up giving the wrong result. So we're gonna explain why in this video, and then I'm gonna show you what the impedance profile of a via actually looks like. So let's go ahead and get started. So we've talked about this issue with via impedance in a different video on via delay. So we had a user question in a previous video that was asking how to calculate the propagation delay of a single via. And there was a model that I showed in that video that actually details how to get the impedance. Once you have that impedance, you can get the via delay or the propagation delay. But I want to focus on the via impedance here because I keep seeing these calculators that may or may not be implementing this specific model in order to get the via impedance. And as we're going to see here in just a moment, the impedance doesn't really matter in those cases where the model is actually correct. So there's one particular model for via impedance that is presented in Howard Johnson's textbook. So if you know who Howard Johnson is, he's the founder of SIGCON. It is a online resource from about 20 years ago that actually has a lot of great advice on high-speed digital design. So in his textbooks, he details this particular model for a via, which can then be used to determine impedance. Now, this model that he uses is essentially a lumped element model where we have a pi filter that represents our via. So this pi filter model has two capacitors and we have our inputs and outputs and then the via barrel is represented as an inductor. So here we have C over two for a capacitance. We have an identical C over two here and then an inductance here. So if you're familiar with pi filters, then you know that this particular model effectively represents a low pass filter. Here, when we have high frequency energy coming in, eventually there would be some roll off in this structure. And then you can define an F three dB of one over two pi times the square root of L C. Then there are some formulas for calculating the L value and the C value. And I'll actually link to an article in the description that shows the formulas for these particular circuit elements. Now, these circuit elements are supposed to represent the via barrel, and then these are supposed to represent the via pads and the antipad. So remember, an antipad is the opening in the ground plane below this via pad, and then the via barrel passes through that opening and then reaches the destination layer. So it's based on not only the pad size, but the anti-pad size. So this model does account for all of the different geometric elements that make up a via and that contribute to the via impedance. And in this case, the via impedance, Z, would just be square root of L over C. Now this is a bit simplified because in reality, we actually have some resistance here and that resistance arises due to the fact that this is made out of copper and copper is not a perfect conductor. So really this would look more like R plus I omega L divided by like I omega C. So this is starting to look a little bit more like transmission line theory, but this is a lumped element circuit and generally we ignore the R and we just have the square root of L over C as our impedance. So why is all of this incorrect? What's wrong with this model? Well, there are a couple of things. So first, as I mentioned, this is a lumped element model. So it doesn't consider wave propagation. And because it doesn't consider wave propagation, it doesn't consider structural resonances in a via structure. And also because of that, it doesn't account for stitching vias. Stitching vias are actually very important in high-speed design and specifically for designing a via transition that can reliably operate up to very many gigahertz frequencies. This is actually only reliable up to maybe on the order of gigahertz frequencies. There's another reason here, which is that this only accounts for electrically short vias. So if we look at a via structure, we can actually see why that's the case. So now let's take a look at an actual via structure. So if I draw out the side view here with a drilled hole, and then I draw my via, 
we'll actually be able to see what's wrong with the typical picture of a via as being an LC circuit. So here I have my plating and of course it's spanning to the top and bottom layers. And then here I have my anti-pads and we'll just assume for the moment a four layer board where we have these anti-pads defined here and we're passing through two ground planes and then ending up on this bottom layer. Now, in this case, if this is only gonna be reliable up to about one gigahertz, what's gonna to happen to the signal that's coming in on a 50 ohm trace? So let's say we have a 50 ohm trace here and the signal coming in on this 50 ohm trace is then transitioning through a via and then going to another 50 ohm trace. This via would ideally be matched in impedance to this trace as well as this trace. So the idea here in order to prevent reflections is that you would then design this to be a 50 ohm via. What happens here if you're at much lower frequencies than one gigahertz? Well, if you're at a frequency below one gigahertz, what happens is the signal that comes in here and transitions through this via is actually going to have a wavelength, assuming an analog signal just for the moment, but is going to have a wavelength that is much longer than this via. So when that happens, this via is very electrically short and its impedance doesn't actually contribute to the impedance seen by this signal. So the input impedance of this particular structure just looks a lot like this value here which is the impedance of our receiving trace. So what that means is that this via could have some impedance that is actually not 50 ohms and it's still gonna work just fine. Could be 30 ohms, could be 70 ohms, whatever the case may be, but it could be some other value and it actually won't affect the signal propagation between this trace and this trace. Now let's just suppose for a moment that we were dealing with a one gigahertz signal or we were dealing with, let's say, a bit stream that had a reliable or useful bandwidth of one gigahertz. How do we know that this is actually gonna be electrically short? Well, what we can do is we can compare the length of this via to the equivalent wavelength of this signal, or this frequency, I should say, um, as it passes along this via. So let's just suppose for a moment that this is a 1.57 millimeter standard thickness PCB. So we've got 1.57 millimeters. This one gigahertz signal has a wavelength of 37.5 millimeters, and this is assuming a very high DK effective value. So we calculated just using the VIA model that the DK effective value should be something like 67, really high value. So you take the square root of that, use that to determine the wavelength, you're gonna get somewhere in the area of about 38 millimeters. Well, this is already much, much longer than this through hole via. And even if we take a very conservative 10% limit on electrical length before we need to account for impedance matching, we're still gonna have 10% of lambda being 3.75 millimeters. So we are much longer than any of the conservative rules of thumb for when we need to start considering impedance matching in this structure. So next I wanna look at what happens when you have a really high frequency signal transitioning through this via. Well, when you have a really high frequency signal that transitions through this via, let's say instead of you know one gigahertz, let's say it's maybe 50 gigahertz. Then what happens? Well, in this case, you're gonna have a wave that actually exists inside of this structure. And when there's a wave that exists inside of this structure, it can build up and excite resonances at certain frequencies. And so the result is that if you were to look at S11 and S21 parameters, you would then see peaks and valleys in that spectrum. And that immediately tells you that at certain frequencies, this via is not matched to 50 ohms reference impedance. Why is that important? Well, that's important because in these models and in these calculators that you'll actually see for via impedance, they always predict that it's just a single impedance, no matter what the frequency is. They're always predicting that it comes out to a very specific impedance and that impedance is constant across all frequencies. That is absolutely incorrect. And these via impedance calculators cannot account for this behavior. So this is where you need something a bit more sophisticated than an LC model in order to calculate the impedance of a via. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you what a via impedance profile actually looks like once you add in stitching vias. So stitching vias like over here and over here are actually very important for setting the impedance of a via to a specific value. 
So we're gonna do some of these simulations in Symbior. Come follow along and watch. All right, everybody. So I'm inside of Symbior right now and I've opened up the VIA Analyzer tool. Once you do that, you'll just need to create a new project and then you can select one of the default stack ups. You can obviously customize a stack up if you want. I've just selected the default one um, just kind of to speed things up for us. Now, in this example, what I'm gonna do is create a new VIA. What happens when we create this new VIA is we can already see something really important here in this curve. Now in this curve, in the right portion of the screen where my mouse is, you can see here this blue line, which is our target impedance, but then we have the actual impedance of this VIA structure. Now what this VIA structure does is we have four stitching VIAs around a VIA structure that has an antipad. This antipad is the green region, and then we've got our incoming and outgoing traces on the top and bottom layers. So you can see that port number one and port number two are labeled right here. And so in this structure, we can actually see that the impedance of this via is very clearly not a constant value. It changes by a very large amount over a really broad frequency range. If we start tuning some of the parameters in this structure, we can really see how the structure changes. So let's just suppose for a moment that we remove all these stitching vias. And then in our pad stack, here you can see we have a 10 mil drill diameter and then a 20 mil anti-pad. And then let's go ahead and expand this pad to something that would be, let's say class two compliant. Here we then have 18 mils and then say here on the bottom side, if we didn't have it connected, we would also have 18 mils. So in this case, we have a 10 slash 18 via, and you can see here that very quickly above about you know four or five gigahertz, you see that the via impedance rises very sharply and eventually gets very large. So it looks very inductive in this region. And then eventually it starts to look capacitive again. If we then change, let's say this anti-pad diameter, make it very large, then you can see here, it brings us down a little bit, but eventually gets to a very low impedance at very, uh, very high frequencies. So this should really underscore the importance that propagation plays on determining the impedance. All of this arises because at beyond these you know, five or 10 gigahertz uh, uh, frequencies, wave propagation is gonna dominate the impedance. And these via impedance calculators that just give you a constant value and don't account for the frequency dependence are actually very incorrect and should not be relied upon for high speed digital design or high frequency analog design. Just kind of as an example here, if we really wanted to, what we could do is we could go over to the 3D model section, tune some of our solver parameters Parameters, and then we could actually go ahead and calculate the S parameters of this circuit. I'm gonna go ahead and actually create a 3D circuit first. I'm just kind of go through the wizard here real quick. And as we go through this wizard, we can now see the frequency as being swept up to very high values, and it's calculating the S parameters in this process. And so at low frequencies, you can see here at about, maybe about one gigahertz, we actually have really excellent impedance matching. And that's why we have this very low value for this S11 and S22 curves. So these two curves actually overlap with each other. And that's why we're only seeing two curves on this graph. So we can very clearly see that here in the magnitude of these S parameters. We have very good impedance matching here. But eventually, once we get into the high gigahertz range, we stop having any impedance matching. And then we have very bad S parameters for this via structure. This should really underscore the importance of getting the impedance of these vias correct. Now we can obviously go back into the via analyzer. We can add in some stitching vias and let's just see for fun what happens when we add in, let's say six stitching vias. So if we add in six stitching vias and we actually apply a pad to them, so let's say we put you know 20 mil pads here and then we spread them out so we can actually manufacture this structure. Now what do you see? Well, now you see that this single via structure actually appears to have um, pretty consistent impedance across a pretty high range of frequencies. Now, this solver is only going to provide accurate results, as we can see here, up to about 48 gigahertz, and that's what's shown in this impedance curve. However, if we were to do this, and then maybe we go back and recalculate the S parameters for this structure again, we can then look in the graph, and we can start to see how this all changes. 
So now this simulation is completing and now you can see here that we get actually much better matching up into the 20 gigahertz range. So this simulation hasn't completed just yet, but we can actually see that it is uh, much more reliable up in this higher frequency range. So it's doing an adaptive algorithm at the moment and so that's why it continues to update here. It's uh, completed the simulation in these lower frequency ranges. So we still have really good matching right around one gigahertz and lower, as you can see by the very low S11 values and the S22 values. Now, when we look in the mid-range frequencies, we can still start to see some pretty good matching. This should really underscore the importance of stitching vias in setting the impedance to a consistent value or to your target value as you try to design via impedance that you need in your interconnects. Okay, so now that we've seen what a via impedance profile actually looks like, what did we catch? Well, we caught that it is not constant at 50 ohms or some other target impedance. It actually changes very strongly throughout a broad frequency range. And so because of that, the area where you actually need to worry about via impedance is in these areas well above one gigahertz when you're dealing with very high speed signals. All right, everybody, thanks for watching this. Make sure to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and you can keep up to date on all of our new videos and of course, the Altium On Track podcast. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. Yeah.